All right, welcome into the Original Gangsters podcast, another long form edition. I am your host, Scott Bernstein. I'm with my uh, partner in crime, my co conspirator, co host, the doctor, Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. And we got Benny behind the glass, our MVP producer. Uh, today, we are going to do a deep dive into the 1993 New England Mafia murder of uh, mob associate Stevie DeSaro, um, who was a, a Providence native that ended up uh, doing a lot of business with the uh, New England patriarchal crime family, got into business with Cadillac Frank Salemi, who was the boss of the uh, of that family and ended up killed uh, in a uh, suburban residence in Boston and then driven across state lines into Rhode Island and buried there back in 1993. It's been 30 years. Uh, the case was finally brought to trial 2018 um, when Cadillac Frank Salemi was taken out of witness protection and put on trial for the murder. Uh, two of the star witnesses were the DeLuca brothers. Bobby DeLuca and Joe DeLuca. Joe DeLuca passed last week. Um, the uh, One of the final uh, members of that hit team uh, that was still alive right now, there is uh, one, one guy, Paulie Wiedek, that uh, is in prison serving time for that. But Cadillac Frank died last December. Uh, Joe DeLuca passed, and uh, we're going to talk about it. And we're going to bring in a just, you know, a guy that uh, we have such respect for and is really, you know, when we talk about OGs and law enforcement, Steve-O, uh, Steve O'Donnell fits the bill uh, and, you know, has been a marquee member of law enforcement for a long time. Please remember to uh, like, subscribe, and share the podcast. Um, we love bringing you this content. We love bringing you guests like Steve and and doing uh, these kind of interviews and deep dives into history. We love taking history and kind of tying it in, tying it into what's going on today. So, Steve, enough of my rambling. Thank you for joining us. We had you last year. We'd love bringing you back. Thank you for uh, for for jumping on the OG pod again. Glad to be here. So, um, what what? Let's just start off with. You know, we're going to unpack it and kind of go piece by piece of, of what happened with Stevie DeSaro, uh, you know, do a little bit of a bio of him and then what led to his um, demise and then what led to the, the cracking of the case and eventually being able to bring his murders to, uh, to trial and, and convict them. Uh, where were you back in, in, in the uh, spring of 1993 when Stevie DeSaro was here? I was in the middle of my undercover world. I was undercover from late 1990, early 91 through mid 96. So smack in the middle of that life. Were you hearing about, I mean, was it something that was really buzzy uh, in the circles that you were, uh, you know, running in? No, it wasn't. It, um, you know, you heard different, he was not a mocky name, Steve DeSaro um, in Rhode Island that was talked about. And sometimes when people disappear, and that's the word we use on this one. Um, it's talked about for a couple of weeks and then it becomes cold. So we weren't pursuing it. So it wasn't like Mass Police came, Mass State Police came down and said, hey, can you collaborate with us? Um, it was their case they worked on. Um, it wasn't something that was shared with us because there, there were really no leads until somewhat, what, 20 something years later. Yeah. You know, I know that at the time, I didn't know at the time, I know now that the police had ideas of what happened, but having ideas of what happened and prosecuting people are much different. And um, let's just kind of give a little background on DeSaro. He was a, a guy that uh, grew up in Providence and grew up around a, a pretty prominent member of the New England Mafia, had a lot of ties to New York. A guy named Nicky Bianco um, was someone that, I don't know if there was an official family relationship. I think he called Nikki his uncle, um, was around Nikki. I think Nikki was one of the people that encouraged him to go to law school and, and go away from being a wise guy. Uh, do, you, do you remember Nikki Bianco? I do. Well, Nikki was one of the, I think I mentioned to you last time, Lou Minocchio and Nikki Bianco. Those two were the old mustache peats. They came from that old environment. 
They dressed properly. They did not want their family members around this business. Nikki was one of those people, but Nikki was very powerful, very well connected um, to New York and Beatles. And it is accurate that Nikki tried to keep his family members and those associated away from the life. And um, so you had a situation where Stevie DeSaro leaves the Providence area, he goes to Boston, he, he, he graduates law school, um, and he, I think he practices a little bit, but really makes a name for himself in the business world as a nightclub owner. Um, and then he starts doing some real estate and construction deals uh, through the years. He owned um, some some clubs in, in Boston. Do you remember? I think one was called the, the Candy Bar might have been. The yeah, offhand, I don't remember the name. Uh, and uh, so he had experience in the nightclub business. 1987, spring of night or uh, spring of 1987, Cadillac Frank Salemi is sprung from prison. Uh, he had done 15 years for trying to assassinate a mob attorney, uh, blew up his car uh, on behalf of, of the, you know, the godfather, the most iconic godfather of that area, Raymond Patriarcha Sr. He was someone that, although he came from Boston, uh, got his nickname really because, not because he drove Cadillacs, he got his nickname because he was someone who was famous for being able to fix Cadillacs as a young man. And did a lot of hits for that for the crime family, but couldn't get his button because he was half Irish. Um, Raymond Sr. didn't want to make him. But when he comes out of prison, Raymond Sr. has passed. Raymond Jr. has taken over. Raymond Jr. was a very weak boss and needed people like Frank Salemi around him to bolster uh, the regime. Makes Frank Salemi uh, pretty quickly thereafter and puts him with a number of legitimate businessmen, mob associates to kind of get Frank Salemi up and running. Um, can you talk about when Frank Salemi first came home uh, in the late 80s and, and started to build uh, what eventually would become his, his, his kingdom? Sure. It would be the real gangster type thing. So Frank was a very violent offender, much more violent than most. Um, they would reach out to him. And he wanted to make his bones, so to speak. Those are the words we use in the wise guy talk. And he wanted to push into that. So because of what happened to him in the shooting at 89, and Billy Grosso got killed, and then Raymond Jr. kind of having that mediation, everybody come together to kind of have the peace. But one of the things I would tell you is, um, historically, Raymond Jr. was always seen as a very, very weak boss. But through prosecutions, we learned later that uh, he could never be like his father. I'm trying to give you like a, a basketball analogy, like if you're not from Rhode Island, Rick Pitino was the man at Providence College. No matter who took over after Rick, it didn't matter. They can't do what Rick did. So the same with the dad. The dad came from a different era, you know, 30 years where corruption was much different. The statutes that charged these guys was much different than they are when Junior was the boss. So Junior certainly was not a street guy, and he attained that leadership role differently than his father. So to your point, when Frank came along, this is Cadillac Frank, he saw what his father was. And that's kind of a fatal error to bring a guy like Frank around because he's hungry. And so when you bent the rules to make a guy like him, then you can see everything that's happened the last probably 30 years of who's getting made, who's not getting made. So Frank aspired to move up. He used Junior like they all do. They use each other. Um, and basically used his violence and his acronym and being a made guy to kind of um, gain power and then try and move Junior out. Junior really didn't want anything to do with it after his prosecution and all the other mob guys got together and said, look, um, they didn't have to convince him too much. You know, not too many mob bosses want to give up their reign, but he didn't want it because he felt it was better that he just stepped aside. And he did, and he moved on to do something different in life. So Frank, I think from the get-go, probably saw this opportunity in front of him, old style gangster. And Frank started putting people around him and he did those criminal favors to get in the position he did. And, and he, I'll close with this. He's no different from any mob guy in America that has turned on their boss in some capacity. Like I mentioned last time, John Gotti, you know, what he did to Frank Castellano. They, you know, they, it's a dangerous and dirty business. What boss wants to take out the next boss? And then Frank aligned himself with people 
Frank gets prosecuted, and he did the same exact thing that other people did. He aligned himself with Bobby, and then we know Bobby's history, and then now we know Joe's history. So, um, and it, and we'll see, we'll see what the future holds with the new bosses. You know who's inside that. We also mentioned um, Saint Laurent. Nobody knew for years that Saint was working for the government, including people like me. I'm on the street working cases against Saint Laurent, not knowing. You know he's a he's a cooperator, and. So you just never know, I think, because they're all looking left, right, back, and front, who the possibility could rattle. And that goes back to um, the murder we're talking about, that DeSaro, they had a fear, Frank had a fear that he was going to cooperate. And, you know, that's and they turned out they murdered him because of that. Now, I think going back with Nikki, if he was stayed in Rhode Island, he might have had a different conversation that would happen. I think he would have probably... Um, have a little more protection if, if if the people that aspired to Nikki's ideology um, and he was protected by Rhode Island guys, remember the boss, underboss thing? Um, and when he's in, he didn't have the same protection in mass because he's not a mass guy. So I doubt very much that Frank cleared that with anybody in Rhode Island. And that could have caused Frank some headaches. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's ever been proven out. Well, there was a timeline factor there to your point. Uh, Nikki Bianco, who helped make the peace uh, between the two warring factions that uh, went to war in the in the in the late eighties, when Raymond really lo- or Raymond Jr. really lost control of the family, and as you uh, referenced, uh, Frank Cadillac Frank survived an assassination attempt in an IHOP parking lot in Saugus, Massachusetts. Had to flee, you know, f- uh, fled the state. I think he went out to California for a little bit to take refuge. And Nikki Bianco helped bring the peace. And, and Nikki, for a short period of time, was kind of caretaker of the family in between Junior and Cadillac Frank. But then Nikki has to go to prison. So Nikki's not even on the street. I think to your point, if Nikki's on, if Nikki Bianco's on the street in 1993, Cadillac Frank is a lot less, uh, probably a lot, or I should say a lot more hesitant to pull the trigger on killing a Stevie DeSaro. And, and in fact, I, I'm pretty sure you know this. At first, when when Frank Salemi was when flipped, when he first flipped and was doing his debriefing, he ref, he didn't admit to any murders that that he ordered in the '90s. And when they brought up Stevie DeSaro's name, he says that came from Nicky Bianco. He blamed Nicky Bianco for Stevie DeSaro's murder uh, until it was discovered that he was actually the the shot caller. Yes, yeah, it's, it's actually. Um... Mob 101 for them that these are to blame the dead guy or someone that can't um, testify. I mean, they're, they're, I would say they're smart and they're very crafty when it comes to that. And, and Frank, I think when he got shot, probably balanced. What do I do? I'm going to get killed. Do I roll and give up all these guys or do I aspire to do what I did? He took the latter. And then when he got jammed up, and to your point, I'm still certain there are probably other homicides that he was involved in that he was never prosecuted. And until he's confronted with that, that's why the federal government charged him. So he had a deal, obviously he violated a deal. Get him for one murder, he can go to jail for life. And he might not get the five or six or 10 others that he committed who was involved in, but at least you take him off the street and he died in prison. Um, did, you know, w- w- would you say when you're describing Salemi I hit the siren, Benny. I, I got to meet him and talk to him a, a couple times. Um, he was one of these guys that I could kind of tell right away that he had that swagger and cachet, that political gangster acumen to to mobilize support. Um, was it something that you recognized as like, wow, this guy is uh, making – waves pretty quickly he gets out of prison and if you read through a lot of the law enforcement documents all the informants are are speaking about how salemi is immediately politicking and going to meet with various factions across new england to try to line up what would be his you know ascent yeah and, and, and you know most of them including him uh, i'm sure nobody will know maybe, maybe some of it's quite record some's not why do you really come to boss most of the time it's the payback for the people that might have been involved in stuff behind that you're the boss. You can make sure that you're cleansing those people from 
your rank, so to speak. So the motivation to be the boss is money, power, but also to retaliate against those who he may perceive might have been involved with murder, or not his murder, but um, the attempted murder, but also those who kind of sat back and let it happen. So you know that he was, you know, someone tried to kill him, and they piece it together differently than the police piece it together. They see it um, totally different, and they have to retaliate. If it's a year, we're down the road. So we have the power, is the power to do that. He may not have to do it. He has the people under him to do it. But yes, he was super much more aggressive than the uh, typical Dons, you know, from Patriarca to Nikki Bianco, um, and even Louis Minocchio after me. Louis was a very laid back person. He was much more of an aggressive personality, um, like a, a throwback to Raymond Ju Sr. when Raymond Sr. was ascending to power. And part of that is to prove yourself. I think some of it might have been insecurities for Frank, knowing that he doesn't have the full um, background to get his button to get made. You know, he thinks I have to do something extra to just kind of showcase that I'm this, you know, person. But you also got to showcase that you're smart enough to run the organization without compromising the people around you. And I don't mean intellectually smart by any means. I mean just street smarts. Um, but that's, you, know, you have a, a boss involved, you know, in a, in a murder. It's pretty unusual. The right. boss is typically mm -hmm. insulated from that. But that just tells you about the aggressive personality of someone like him. I have a question uh, about culture here and psychological predisposition. This came up in our episode. I don't, I don't know if it will be available by the time people are watching this, but we talked about Connecticut and some guys go into this life because it's important to them in terms of their identity and their and their socialization. Other guys, um, it's just a means to an end. Like having a button means that you have more license to steal, to kill, uh, to, to accumulate more power. With with Salami, what, what what would you say your profile of him was? Was he a guy that like Cosa Nostra, like that was important to his identity, or was it more like this is, um, you know, the, the, to get in with the with the in group means I can I can earn more as a killer and a gangster, um, or is it complicated? Is it is it maybe some of both? No, it's actually some of both. It's exactly both with him, um, and his ascension might be different from others, but. Power and money, that's all the ideology is, power and money, power and money, and how that can corrupt our system. So from his perspective, and I've never talked to Frank Salemi, I will tell you, I think I might have mentioned it before, I was on a surveillance in Emerald Square Mall in Massachusetts by myself. You know, someone saw Frank and Bobby meeting, so I, I surveilled him, and not as an undercover guy, just as a state trooper, but dressed similar to the way you guys dress, and sitting in the food court, and I didn't know at the time, but you know, Frank uh, saw me, and he just, that look, if the Frank saw me look, like he looked, and you know, I'm a street guy, so I recognize the street guy, look, it's time for me to leave. So I leave, and make way down four sets of stairs to a store, get my car, and drive away. Don't think much more of it, you know, I went back my report, Bobby Frank together, not unusual. And when we debriefed Bobby, Bobby told me, not know it was me, that Frank thought that he was getting followers hit, and Frank was following, trying to follow that guy, which was me. And like Frank was walking towards me very smartly, if I, did, if I could tell you. And if I had stayed in the food court, it would have been a confrontation because he was coming up to me. Now, I don't know if he's on, not on, but he looked, and not me realizing he thinks someone's going to hit him. So their mentality is they're on guard, not always for the police, they're on guard for us. They're on guard for who's surveilling them that might try and take them out. Maybe it's almost square mall. So it gave me a different perspective than the undercover perspective I had of a Frank. How do you live that way with 24 7? You're worried about it. And you know why? Because that's all he did. He was doing, he did this, the way he aspired to become a leader is really an aggressive way. So he thinks everybody else is doing the same thing. And to keep tabs on everybody around you, you basically have to kill half the people that try and become made guys because they're trusting. You know, paranoid personality. Um, does not make for a good boss. And I'm not, I don't want to equate good with them. Um, I think you mentioned star witness. It can't be anything further than the truth. Star and witness of a DeLuca. But I know I understand the, the analogy. So back to Frank. I think Frank's um, egocentric much more than any other mob boss in the last several decades. And his growth to power was so quick and violent that he think he thought everybody around him was doing the same thing. At the end of the day, 
he just gave up and said, you know, I'm going to cooperate, but I'm smarter than the government. I'm not going to tell him everything. And it backfired. And, you know, obviously the rest is history. I see a parallel with Nikki Scarfo, that kind of projection that like, Scarfo, whenever someone started gaining wealth and popularity, he started to assume that they were going to try to take him out eventually because that's how he thought. The, oh see my. what I mean? Scarfo's projecting, which that wasn't necessarily the case, but Scarfo just started to assume everyone else was, was sort of maniacal and scheming like him. So then you start to think, well, then I, I just have to kill them because they're going to come after me because that's what I would do. Yeah. No, if you go through history... Um, beyond Philadelphia, and John Gotti went through with Sammy Germano, then they played the tapes, and Sammy, you know, from Sammy's perspective, I'm always going to be loyal to John, but he got so powerful and so influential with all the scams he was running, you know, these guys were all paranoid, same with Frank Philemon, he's paranoid, because he knows how he is sending the power, so it's not that the, blue, the, um, the blueprint is already there, he knows someone's going to do it, it's just a matter of who it is. So, and, you know, Sometimes the wrong guys are uh, set up to get killed. Yeah. So, so Salemi takes power. I wouldn't say he really won the war, but the war was kind of stopped by the fact that there was this big bust. Um, very shortly after the assassination attempt, uh, Nikki Bianco, again, kind of is a placeholder for a couple months. He goes or is slated to go away, and Salemi comes back into town. Um, and and assumes the throne. Uh, just to backtrack a quick second. So when when Salemi comes home, Junior Patriarcha puts him with a group of mob associate businessmen type uh, that can basically serve as a bank. I mean, for for Salemi to get with these guys and put his hands in their pockets and get some legitimate employment. Um, one of these guys is Stevie DeSaro. DeSaro starts palling around with um, Cadillac Frank, uh, um, guys like Raymond Jr., who, who's in that circle, Tommy Hillary, who was Raymond Sr.'s um, a surrogate, adopted son, and um, Frankie Boy Salemi, who was Cadillac Frank's son, who had all of the, the, the lunatic tendencies of his father with none of the charisma. Um, and at some point, right when Cadillac Frank comes back and settles into the boss's chair, Frankie Boy and Stevie DeSaro come to him with a plan to buy a very iconic, famous rock club in South Boston called The Channel. Um, and they basically kind of steal the deal to take the place over. Uh, it's, it's being uh, owned and run by the Boris brothers, a couple Greek guys uh, who had, I believe started the club or, or took it over very quickly after uh, uh, it, it opened. And they started, they, they get into negotiations with the Boris brothers. And I believe there was a, I'm going to throw this to you and see if you, if you had heard this, I believe there was an, a situation where they were negotiating the purchase price at a restaurant in the North End, and the Salemis were trying to take the business on pennies for the dollar, or pennies on the dollar for what it was worth. And one of the Borises pushed back on it, or someone involved in the deal pushed back on it, and Frankie Boy Salemi, not Frank Sr., Frankie Boy takes up a, a dinner plate and breaks it over the guy's head to kind of say, we don't care what you want to, we don't care what you want us, what you want us to give you for the bar. We're going to give you what we're going to give you and you're going to leave. Now it's, it's a, it's a very typical, um, I would say mob shakedown is the best way to describe it. So yeah, that they typically would like a piece of those places. It's strip clubs, restaurants that make money. Uh, they're really usually satisfied with what are the taxes. Say it's a thousand dollars a week. It's all they want. They don't want to be part of the ownership because then they get you to hire a IRS business. It's usually having somebody else run the business for them. It's very common. They become victims of extortion, but they're willing victims. And it happened locally here in the Foxy Lady. That's what happened with Louis Minocchio. Where he's getting taxed. But the people that own those places, 
give it to them, but it's giving it to them. They'll testify. I think the owner of the Fox, they testify. Yeah, I give them that amount of money, but no big deal because that's to the essence of organized crime is that they put the arm on you and then you have to pay them typically because they got something on you. Um, like you owe them money. So they step in, they try and take a piece of them that way. Or if it's a local restaurant, strip club, um, the channel. Well, anything lucrative back in 30 years ago, they could get their hands on it. They put the arm on you to your point with um, Junior Salemi cracking someone over the head. You know, a kid couldn't fight hand to hand with anybody, um, but you're not going to fight back with them. Um, I can tell you historically, you know, a lot of these guys were not tough guys. There's a handful of tough guys, but if you fight with them, you can't fight back. And I'll give you an example. I was a collector for a wise guy, and I'd have to go collect money. I can't use violence as a cop. And so I got a guy that was a cooperator with me. He said, look, I had to slap the guy around a little bit after I take the money. No, you can't because you're an agent of us. So um, it's just the, the mob of war. Um, we could probably talk about this some other day about this guy that flipped and he flipped on the wise guys because he called me cold one day. They were a kid. said, I want to cooperate. Didn't believe him. I met with him and a boss. And he said, um, I lived this life. I cracked heads. I didn't kill anybody. I did this, this, and this. And now that I owe money, they're turning on me. I'm done with these guys. I'm going to wear a wire. And he did. And um, it, we went up on bugs. We went on wiretaps. We incarcerated about 20 people. Then we sent him, you know, away in the Rivers Relocation Program. He's passed since then. But um, I think to go back to your perspective, you mentioned earlier, why would they get in this world? Um, I think you mentioned earlier. Uh, until you talk to one of them, it's it's just like doing what you do. What you think is very regular, that's what they do. They grew up around it. They think it's part of what they want to do. Uh, I remember flipping a young man, um, and he's no longer involved in the world. But when I did, he said, "You, were, I do. I would have killed someone to get a button." I was so enthralled in this world. And when he raided this house, he had every mob book, every mob movie, and they and his uncle was a mob guy, and that's what they knew, and they. Whatever reason they believe in that life, I think part of why we're talking now is because so many people are so imbued with how these organizations operate. And most of it's just based on, lack of a better term, I don't know if you can swim, but scaring the shit out of people. Um, yeah, some people got hurt, some people broke, got broken legs, broken arms, but a lot of it is, is the fear that's of retribution if you don't do what they tell you because they can read, they can write books. Um, and I can tell you anecdotally, I was in uh, the Cater Social Club watching gamblers come in to pay their debt. And then me and another guy are bouncing each other, you know, off the walls and like they're beating me up that I didn't pay. And nobody can see it. It's behind a wall. I'm screaming, no, I'll pay, I'll pay. And, and that guy leaves thinking that's all legit. And I'm not saying they don't do that. People do get hurt. But a lot of it's bullshit. And when you leave, they leave. We're all laughing about that guy being scared to death that he's going to pay. And he'll be back next week to pay. And then most of the degenerates, I mean degenerate gamblers, and then when they get in debt, then I give you my hand, they get their hooks into you. And you could have a legit business. You could be working in courts. You could work in the post office. You could work anywhere that they could figure out an advantage for them. Um, that's how they operate. They're kind of like a, I wouldn't say a Fortune 500 company, but they know how to get their hooks into somebody. And that's that they know those people aren't coming to the police because they already have they're doing their legal behavior with those things. There's a science to it that that all these guys are it's just it's like an innate reflex. They know wise how guy to, allergy. That's the word. Wise guy allergy. They, they they know how to cut into people like you know how to cut into a turkey sandwich. <laughs> they know how to cut in and, and, and get a piece of somebody and you know, if somebody will give them an inch, they'll take a hundred miles. And I think Again, I went to segue, and, and Jimmy and I were talking off uh, off air. I mean, I think the Stevie Desaro, the CB Desaro case. We might have said this a year ago when we, we interviewed you for the first time. It's really a cautionary tale. Um, and, and he had been around wise guys, I think, his whole life. I'm not sure how much business partnership he had in the way that he had uh, the partnership with Salemi. I think it it, it was more where he was being taxed but in the case of 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 salemi cadillac frank and frankie boy 
and Tommy Hillary and Bobby DeLuca, um, they sunk their teeth into the channel and it wasn't just a, a monthly shakedown. They were setting up shop in the back of that, um, you know, the back office of the channel. Frankie Boy was working there every night. DeSaro, they obviously had faith in DeSaro from someone who had a nightclub background to run the nightclub. And he was, from, from everything I can understand, he was doing his best. But you had a situation where they were just looting the place. Uh, and Hillary, Tommy Hillary ends up getting booted out of town by Cadillac Frank because he's caught skim in the skim. And, and Tommy Hillary ends up testifying at, at, at Cadillac Frank's trial that he's that for, you know, three or four years, he's with Cadillac Frank every day. They're thick as thieves. Tommy was running, I think, Framingham, uh, uh, the rackets up there for, out there for him. And then they find that there's like, uh, $5,000 missing or something. Salemi calls him to a meeting in Chinatown. Bobby DeLuca's there. Frankie Boy Salemi's there. And he grabs Hillary by the neck and says, you get out of this town uh, by tomorrow night or, or I'm going to kill you. We, you don't steal from me. And I think it was, a, it was a, Hillary made a comment on the stand. We said, I, I ruined my whole life for $5,000. Uh, I, I think he said he wanted to give his girlfriend uh, money to start a a nail salon or something. Uh, so the business is being raided. People are being booted out, whether it be the Boris brothers, Tommy Hillary, uh, Frankie boy is getting into uh, a lot of tiffs with, I, there was an incident where he beat up a, um, a drummer of a rock band that was there by late 92. The place is, is kind of bled dry they they switch to a they switch formats. They rename the channel Soiree, make it a strip club. It's again uh, uh, failing. It's in the red. Stevie Desaro, and this is where I want to you know get your uh, a professional opinion. Stevie Desaro at some point in early 1993 is pulled over by the FBI, brought into a meeting, and told that he is going to be indicted for a bank fraud related to some construction or real estate deals down in Florida. The Salemis believe that he's skimming the skim like Tommy Hillary was. And they're convinced that DeSaro is cooperating. The FBI went on the stand in 2018 at the, at the Salemi trial and said, DeSaro had not cut a cooperation deal. What, what what is your take on that? Was Desaro cooperating, or was the belief that he was going to cooperate, or that he was already compromised? Yeah, it, it's the belief. So I, I think we I just talked about nobody trusts each other in that business. So when you get arrested, every antenna goes up. You know, when you're around the police, and you talk to them, and they don't trust each other. So you've got this one skimming, that one skimming. There, no honor among thieves. I know that's an old adage. It's the truth. That they're better off paying. Look, if they were smarter, they should have had Sarah paying you X amount of dollars a month or week and agree to that. If they watch the income flow be better, they re they retax them. I'm not encouraging them to do this, but for them to nickel and dime, because if the Saro can't figure out how to run his business properly, and then other crimes come in. So if that's his only other business interest in Florida, if he makes a mistake. And the you know the FBI is no different than else. They know um, the business is run by Salemi, and they know if they can put the arm on the sorrow or any other person that's being shirked down there to get them to cooperate, it's just lower buying fruit gives you bad bigger fruit. So if he's cooperating or not, you know, it wouldn't be fair for me to talk about it at that time. But I will tell you, anytime anybody gets arrested, consider it. Well, and he was just to be clear, he wasn't arrested. He was, oh, told, he was told that he was going to be indicted. Right. And he's, you know, he's telling lawyers, lawyers all talk to each other in that world. You know, either you're arrested or you've talked to the police. Um, and that's where I'll tell you, when we would walk up on wise guys and talk to them, some of them were like, look, I get away from it. I don't want you talking to me. Because just that, you know, for more than a couple of minutes, somebody, hey, I saw Steve O'Donnell talking to the women out there. I saw so-and-so. 
especially if you're in the public, one thing, but if you're in a, a, a closed place, you know, a restaurant where you're sitting in a cubicle, someone sees you, none of them trust each other. So if you're going to get indicted, they kind of balance the two. I'm sure they've had conversations with the sorrow. And then they're all paranoid in the first place. Look, this isn't going to be good. If he rolls over, we're done. Let's do what we got to do. And then um, I don't think they're willing to wait on those things. So I think there's more reactionaries to your point that this isn't good that either the FBI is bluffing or, but that happens every day in America. With the law enforcement that handle these type of cases are always um, trying to indict people for cases and that lead to the next level. Because I told you, I mean, I know you know this, it's all insulary. It's very unusual for the mob boss to be dealing yeah, well, with Yeah, well, yeah. The fact that he was, the, the fact that Salemi was this close to the, 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 the very specifics and particulars and details of this contract, and we'll get to it in, in, in a couple minutes, the fact that he actually drove the body in the trunk of his car across state lines to deliver it to the DeLuca brothers is mind-blowing to me. This is three years into his reign as Don, and he, he's so hands-on, he's, so, he's such a micromanager that he wants to carry a, or, or deliver a body. I mean, it, to your point, it, it's... It's a unicorn, unicorn yeah. of a situation. But no modern day boss would be this close to a murder. Guy. I mean, doesn't that tell you about his like mindset though? That he's he's yeah. still a street guy. It's yeah. like even though he's technically the boss, like he seems like the kind of guy that he likes he's driving a body to. Yeah. He gets a charge <laughs> on him. Yeah, like whereas like a lot of the guys, once you're the boss, the point is you can be insulated. You don't get your hands dirty, and and now enjoy the the fruits of being a boss, but. A guy like that, the way he's wired, it, it seems like that like he genuinely enjoyed being involved in street crimes. Steve, well, I think to just clarify, I totally agree, but I think most of that is goes back to he doesn't trust anybody around him. And then because the way he aspired to leadership, he sees who do I trust? I trust Bobby. And then and you look at the DeLuca, no, not DeLuca trial, but the DeSaro trial, it's mind blowing that Joe DeLuca can get a phone call from the mob boss. Hey, I need a favor. I need to ask him over his lawn. I need you to move a body for me. Oh, okay. Like who, what human being would say, you're out of your mind, I don't, and hang up on him. But as I talked about Joe publicly, he wanted to live in both lives. He wanted to be this legit guy, this kind of simple guy doing his pizza stuff. Then mob boss, like they called you up on the phone. Hey, you got, you got a minute? Yeah, can you, I need your favor. It's not like he bullshitted him and said, listen, um, I'd like you to meet me at the corner. And then when he gets to the corner, hey, look, I want you to drive this car and drop this car off. And the guy has no knowledge. He tells him everything he wants to do, which tells me it's even more ludicrous they talk like that on the phone. Like old bosses would meet in person. You know, that's just crazy, crazy conversation on a telephone. But my counsel wasn't coded. It wasn't like, I need you to take this guy. Raymond Jr. would say, send him to California. You'd learn later that means that guy's going to get killed. But if you prosecute them, you need someone validating that. So I think to your points that he was so paranoid, I'm going to he did it. So he's got this murder and he's calling the closest people he knows that he trusts implicitly, not anybody else around him, which tells you he didn't have a real trusting circle around him. And also, doesn't that tell you about his trajectory, though? Like he's not a guy who was a soldier for 15 years and then a captain for 10 years and then has all this experience under his belt to be more cautious. Like, right, he, he really was a fast riser in terms of his position in the administration. I know he was a gangster for a long time and he was in prison for a long time, but I'm talking about between him getting a guy to <laughs> capo to boss in three years. <laughs> That's what I mean. So, like, he, he I think that – that shows you something, and th and that's been one of the issues I think that Cosa Nostra has, has been wrestling with for a, a, a long time now. There's so many um, so many guys get incarcerated that um, guys are getting promoted faster through the ranks than they used to because <laughs> people are going to prison, and you you don't really have a choice. And then so then what you have is this sort of guys who are in a leadership position who maybe thirty. 20, 30, 40 years ago, wouldn't have been in a leadership position to begin with. Does, does that make sense? No, there's no question about it. You're 100% on out. But for Frank, 
when he aspired to the leadership position, part of it was the other people said yes in fear. And if they said no, you're going to have a bloodbath. They knew it. So it's not like you had a benign other leader competing with him. They saw his trajectory. They probably felt it stronger. Look, let's make him in this position. He can control it better when he's the boss. If he's not the boss, he's just going to try to kill the boss another way, unless we kill him. And that didn't work out the first time. And he yeah. fooled me once, fooled me twice. He had all these wacky plans when you read um, affidavits about flying a drone with a gun in the booth house. And, you know, he's a little more imaginative than most, but think about bombings, you know, all those things that he was, the people that allowed him to become the boss certainly acquiesced, I think, because he said he's much more violent than the others that were in that leadership vacuum. And he aspired to that because he forced his way in. And in to to something you said earlier about another motivation for him to become boss at that point was to have the power to purge the faction of the family that had tried to kill him. And that kind of gets in now to where we are, you know, segging it back to 93. Uh, it's in the middle of what I call, you know, what I call or what I have kind of described in my research as a kind of a five, six year purge uh, or, or, or a house cleaning, if you will, where he systematically got rid of anybody that was aligned with the faction that that opposed him. We had some of those guys from behind bars still uh, part of that Russo uh, Ferrara, uh, East Boston, North End faction that were, were still kind of pulling some strings on the street. And DeSaro kind of fits in the middle of this bloodletting that, that, la that lasted for about five, six years and that Cadillac Frank never admitted to. So you had a situation where I don't think it's a coincidence that, that they didn't leave DeSaro in the street. They got rid of the body. I, to me, that kind of says that he, maybe he was a he was worried about what other people uh, in other mafia families or within his family would have thought of him getting rid of. I know at that point, uh, I don't believe Nicky Bianco was dead. He was still in prison. I feel he died a year or two later. But uh, you know, these other murders that that he was either taking part in or ordering were all kind of cowboy style. Guys left in trunks of cars and, and strewn on the streets. DeSaro just didn't. And again, another to another one of your points earlier in the podcast, he just didn't come home one day. And there was a very, um, I think, legitimate theory that he was in, you know, in on the outs with his wife. He was on the outs financially. He was on the outs with Salemi. That maybe he just, you know, disappeared himself. I mean, like took off and, and tried to a little piece of doubt that you know he left for another woman or something because they haven't found his body to your point the bodies are left on the street and left for a reason left in the place on purpose where the hit happened on purpose from Spock State College to right up on Federal Hill there's always messages behind that that people want to know that um, this probably um, I'm not really sure how well planned it was I think it was Plan, but then reactionary. He started strangling. Next thing you know, we kill him. Now what do we do? We're stuck. Uh, I still believe in my core. If he planned it differently, if they, I think it was more reactionary murder. That we probably had a conversation with him where they were then convinced more than the day before that he was going to testify or cooperate. Then we probably had words, strangle him. Then what do we do? That would make more sense to me having Frank there. If he was going to set it up, why would he be there in the first place except the point that he loves it? So yeah. now we're stuck. We've got this dead guy that's got some connection to Providence. Um, we bury him. We just leave it at that. Nobody knows it's us. And then there's a doubt always what happened. That's my, my opinion. So let's, let's go and, and talk about the specifics of the hit. So May 10th, 1993, it's the day after Mother's Day. Uh, Stevie DeSaro and his family had a, a, a meal the night uh, on a, I was, I believe it was a, the night he, or the day he was murdered was a Monday on that Sunday night. I think he had some type of altercation, some verbal altercation with his wife. That uh, the days leading up to the meeting that he had been summoned to at Salemi's 
home in suburban Boston, he had been telling people that he thought that Salami might kill him. Uh, he was talking to his girlfriend, who was a stripper, uh, at the uh, at the former channel, which became Soiree, uh, being pretty clear that he felt like he was on thin ice with his partners. Frankie Boy Salemi comes in, in a red Jeep that was owned by his girlfriend, uh, shows up at the DeSaro house, I think around 10 o'clock, 1030, uh, to pick him up, take him to the meeting. Uh, they, they show up at the meeting around 11 o'clock, I believe, and very quickly after DeSaro walks into the Salemi uh, family home, Frankie Boy and Frankie Boy's best friend, Polly Wiedek, attack him, strangle him to death, and according to eyewitnesses, both Frank, Cadillac Frank Salemi is there watching, and Cadillac Frank's brother and acting boss, uh, John Salemi, who they called Action Jack, was also there. Um, they have the, the body on, on like the kitchen floor. There had been a discussion between Salemi and Bobby DeLuca the day before where Salemi had told DeLuca, I'm going to call you with a package. They called that night to the DeLucas in Providence and said, I'm bringing you the package. I think another, another thing I'm going to, uh, you know, tie into something you said. I think that the first part of the execution was planned pretty well. Uh, I think the back end, the burial part was, was a little more helter skelter where Salemi had given the responsibility to the DeLucas and the DeLucas seemed a little bit um, not as buttoned up as, as you would want to be when you're burying a body, especially if you're Bobby. And Bobby at that point was a capo or a Kingsman capo. He was Salemi's eyes and ears in Rhode Island, his best friend. And uh, so Bobby sends Joe. Joe meets Cadillac Frank in a, I think it was a drugstore parking lot in North Providence takes the body in the in the trunk of, of from from Cadillac Frank's car to the trunk of Joe DeLuca's car and in a tarp Cadillac Frank tells Joe DeLuca be sure to remove the tarp when you dump the body it's got fingerprints all over it Joe DeLuca goes on Bobby's instructions to the uh, uh, uh the construction a construction site at the uh in the back of a converted textile mill that was owned by a, a crew member of Bobby's named Billy Ricci. And they dump him in there, but they forget to take the tarp away. So they have to go back a day or two later. They get the tarp, they throw it away. And then nobody hears from Stevie DeSaro for 25 years. A couple of months after this, Joe DeLuca is made into the patriarchal crime family, sponsored by, by his brother Bobby in a ceremony that's conducted by Cadillac Frank and Baby Shaq's Minocchio, Louis Minocchio. So, again, Joe DeLuca, I want to get your take on this before we get to 2016 and, and when they dig the body up. Joe DeLuca is, is not known as a wise guy. His brother Bobby is. Uh, he's more known as the guy that works at the bakery in Johnston and, and later on is known for singing this commercial jingle that was pretty popular. Uh, kind of this wacky, goofy character. No one looked at him as a wise guy. And he, you know, it, it obviously meant something to him to get his button. And it meant something to Bobby to get Joe's button, because I don't think Bobby would have inserted Joe into this murder conspiracy if, if that wasn't important to him. No, I agree. Um, I, I remember when the word was out on the street, you know, what the look was made. And, you know, the investigators I know were perplexed. Like, how did that happen? You know, combing the streets with informants and asking, how did that happen? Nobody knew. Uh, even, you know, gangsters that cooperated with those, like, you know, not made guys, but underneath that, everybody's kind of perplexed by it. And they kept that a pretty good secret because obviously, if Joe told somebody that might be back to us and he was involved in moving the body. But yeah, and it's just amazing to me, and I mentioned before, you can't have it both ways. You're either gangster or not. But the new wave, a lot of these, Guys in the organized crime world are regarded in the public. People like them. They're likable people. They're funny. They're engaging. And, but they also like the other part of the world. And they like to be 
gangsters, although we can talk about other gangsters who fought their way into the crime families that never did anything relating to murder. So it used to be a murder. You know, I'm not saying we aspire if someone kills someone, but that's one of the reasons, one of the four reasons to become a, a made guy. Um, he moved the body. So I think they had to stretch the rules again to bring Joe in. So it's not like this is some innocent guy, and I think some people portrayed him as this great guy. He decided to be sworn in, put his hand up, put his trigger finger put. All that stuff really happens. It was proven in the Medway bugging ceremony, and I'm going to become a made guy. So the next time they need a favor, they can go to Joe DeLuca, who's also a mainstream guy where everybody thinks he's not a bad guy. And who knows, could he set somebody up? Well, we find out later that he was more deeper involved, like Raymond Jr., a little more deeper involved than we actually thought. Because you don't become a made guy in a organized crime family unless you, I would think he did a little bit more than move the body. To your point with the body, it's almost comical to read the transcripts about the top. You know, back then he didn't have DNA, but they were conscious of fingerprints. And then they were, I think, wheeling their body down in a dolly or a hand truck, and it fell off. It's almost like a movie. Um, but as I said, I was talking to Tim White last week on Channel 12 about the passing of Joe DeLuca. I don't think the DeSaro family thinks Joe DeLuca is a good guy. Um, so that's where I tell people that he hey, wasn't a bad guy. Yeah, he's a bad guy. He's in a blood oath organization that determined two guys. And secondly, we, he admitted to helping move somebody's son, somebody's father, someone, that kind of thing. That really frustrates me when I hear it, that that's not what good people do. So um, when you're talking, when your listeners listen to the gangster stuff, I hear a lot of pushback to me about certain guys being good guys. There's nothing good about them. It doesn't impact you. That's great. But it impacted the sorrow. The sorrow is a human, his family, and they'll never go away. And, and that's the stuff that is really, I would say, intriguing but frustrating when it comes to gangsters because they think they have their God. I can kill someone because they're going to testify against someone, not even thinking twice about their family. And most of them have family and probably think about that if their wife or children lost somebody the same way, how devastating that would be to them. But that's the life they chose to go in. I don't think Stephen So chose to go in that life. He did choose to associate with those people and allow them to shake him down, and the end result was he paid for it with his life. I have a question about you know, bringing up the family. Um, my understanding is that DeSaro left a note to his kid on his way before he left for that meeting that was sort of ominous, like uh, at least that's one way of thinking about it, that he, he may have had some insight that when you go to meet with these guys, you don't come back. Either one of you can comment on that? Did he, did he have some sense was like he was in da danger? It was a letter, and I'll turn it over to Steve. It was a letter that we didn't know existed until the trial. I don't think Stevie DeSaro's wife even knew that letter had been written. The son testified at the trial. I don't remember how old he was. Um, I think he was just a little kid, right? Yeah, and this, the letter was basically saying, you're the man of the family. Yep. The, most of them have instincts when they're around these people. If you watch you know, wise guy movies, this is another movie waiting to happen that's the exact replica of Donnie Brasco or Casino, all these others. But it's really the same thing where they turn on each other and, you know, they eat Stephen DeSalle disappears. The family's frustrated. The family, you know, tried to find him and everybody played dumb. And then, you know, I mean, it's not a good, it's a good thing they found out and someone got prosecuted for it. But it's just, um, it, to me, I just find the real world amazing. And if you're investigators now, you're looking at the same things. And murder, 20, 30, 40 years ago, whatever it is, is of no statute limitations. So if you can go to jail at 80, you know, some investigators say, why chase these guys around? Well, because they were killing people. And so if they could be held responsible and the family could get some solace out of that, because you know, nobody deserves to get killed. That's really the bottom line. I know it sounds cheap, but back to these organized crime followers, um, when, I'll give you an example. When, um, Scott, when um, Joe died, you look at all these blogs out there, you know, different places, and I'm on some of them. Some people don't even know that I'm on them. I kind of laugh. Like, I never comment. I just watch. And, you know, he's a rat, picture of a rat with a head off, a squirrel with a head off. Like, um, it, it's just, a, it's amazing. And the other people in that same family, 
you know, like Joe would consider rat, Bobby's consider rat, Frank Salemi, does he consider rat? And the word rat is so synonymous in our culture, in subcultures where people, even kids in high school, I coach high school, I'm not ratting on that kid. When you're four or five, I'm not ratting on that kid because it's become so taboo when it's, um, it, that's all trickled down from criminal organizations that made it crystal clear that you shouldn't be doing that. Well, maybe you should be talking to people about what, and that, that way we, we would really put a stranglehold, no point intended, on organized crime because everyone's so afraid even in, in the government or in the witnesses, people, you know, our peers, they don't want to come forward when they get it. It's easier sometimes to just pay to get rid of them, which is, um, I just think, is ruthless. Because once they do it once, they got you. I, I, mean, I, 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 I want to yeah. back up just for a moment. I'm, I'm, I, I, we interviewed Harry Boris, by the way. People can listen to that audio episode. The, the, he, he was having some connectivity issues, and the, the audio wasn't very good, so we cut the. In, I mean, the, so we cut it short. But it, it's kind of interesting to get some, you know, insight from the dude that actually lived through this. Uh, I can't remember though. Why did they go to the sorrow? Did they need a cash infusion or something? Why did they get mixed up with him and Salami no, Jr. Did, in the first place? They just decided they wanted to sell. They wanted to get oh, out of the rock and roll business. I, I see. Okay. And then DeSaro and Frankie Boy had heard that the club was going to be up for sale and had, an, you know, brought it to Cadillac Frank and said this would be a good investment. Right. And then, but they were still on board during the transition, the Boris brothers. Right. right. So and they were, a, they were watching it as it was being cannibalized. And yeah. so yeah, for okay, about a okay. year, I think the DeSaro Salemi team had taken over the day to day operations of the club, but it was still in the name of Boris when the uh, particulars of the, the purchase was be, were, were being worked out. And yes, they saw firsthand what was going on and then were, were, ripped off in in the sale from what i recall i mean i don't think they had a problem with Desaro, right it was salemi jr that it was, was, it was frank jr it was frank jr they didn't mind working with the if i recall it was it was they the, might have known to sorrow because they they own clubs and he owned clubs right right it, it was, was the, the son that they had was they felt frankie, was the main problem and frankie boy was at the club every day causing a lot of problems right um and so Let's let's do a. It's 2016, and let's do a where everybody's at. Frankie Boy is dead. Uh, he died of AIDS-related cancer, leukemia in 1995. Um, was living a crazy life. It's believed that he he, he was infected by a, a prostitute, um, or or a or a dirty needle. He was someone that per, partook in a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, Cadillac Frank is in witness protection. Bobby DeLuca is in witness protection. Uh, Paul Wiedek at, at this point is running around with the Denunzio brothers uh, in Boston uh, working as a plumber. And Joe DeLuca is doing his commercial jingles for, for the original Italian bakery. Uh, early 2016, Billy Ricci gets jammed up in a drug case. At that actual converted textile mill, he's using it to grow marijuana, doesn't have a license, and uses the fact that he knows that DeSaro's body is underneath the mill as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, feds show up in the end of March and start digging. They dug for a couple days, and I believe the last day of March of 16, they they find DeSaro. His body is still... or his bone and the remnants, uh, the remains, you can still see his Sergio Tacchini tracksuit uh, in, in, the, in the makeshift grave. And if I was a DeSaro family member, I think to me the most frustrating part of this 25-year journey to find justice would be the fact that two of the killers – had become government cooperators and were never pressed hard enough to admit their role in this. And it wasn't until a, a kind of a random incident leads to a guy leading them to where the, where the body is. Frank Salemi literally 
bolts from witness protection, knowing that they're coming to get him. Bobby DeLuca, I think, goes back to the uh, to the feds and says, make me the, the best deal I can make. And he agrees to cooperate against uh, and testify against Cadillac Frank. I, I'll give my opinion, and then I want to get yours, uh, Steve. It, to me, I think we talked about this a year ago, but maybe not. To me, not only is that frustrating from the DeSaro point of view, it's clear that Cadillac Frank was keeping his mouth shut to protect Bobby. It wasn't to protect his son because his son was dead when he flipped. And Bobby, when Bobby flips, he's keeping his mouth shut to protect Cadillac Frank in, in witness protection. No, he's spot on. And protecting each other, too. Frank's kept protecting himself. Uh, as I mentioned to you the other day, he, they just think they're smarter than everybody else. And when Billy Ritchie's place got raided, and then shortly thereafter, they're digging. You know, there's a lot of word on the street. This is from sources, not from the police. That you know, you can piece together. Say March first, Billy gets raided from the pot, and he's not charged. And then you know, several weeks later, the place is dug up. The talk was that Billy cut some type of deal. That was out on the street, not law enforcement laws. So that would be like why Billy Ritchie survived that. They all felt like remember they felt the Sar was a was going to cooperate. Did they think Billy Ritchie was going to cooperate? Because they know who allowed them to bury him. They knew the certain amount of people, a small number of people that knew. They kept it a secret a very long time. So we had thought that Billy Ritchie was going to be black. So just uh, instinctually because of the connection. I mean, I don't have to put that connection together to be involved in it. But, you know, the street puts that to bed together pretty quickly. Like, to your point, when DeSaro, they felt that he might get indicted, the feds came to see him. But when the feds raided Billy Ritchie, the public was like anybody didn't know. There's law enforcement, police, province, police, state police, and FBI. And then all of a sudden, you're digging behind the building. There's only a handful of people know where they can be digging, obviously. The point to Billy. So there are so many of these insulary names and players that if that body never got found, Billy Ritchie would have to be doing a favor for somebody else, someone else. And if he's growing pot, he's paying a piece of that, you know, whatever 10% juice to some wise guy. My guess is, I don't know if they've been proven that he had to be paying a piece of that to a Bobby or Frank. And they trusted him enough. And I think um, the history now you have Bobby and um, Joe. And Frank all cooperating, yeah, that'd be a frustrating point for a family member that they committed a murder, um, and we, you can't prove they committed the murder until Billy Ritchie said, "Hey, I'm gonna cooperate. Here we go." And then Frank had prosecuted that. And I think we talked earlier that there's there's no way Frank's fully gave up all the things he did. And I think they probably tried to protect each other because there's a lot of history between Bobby and Frank. Bobby wouldn't have been anything in that world without Frank. No question about it. I mean, Frank trusted Bobby implicitly. Had to be that way if he's calling Bobby to ask his really challenged brother to help move a body. You know what I mean? So I, I think I, I agree with you both. I think you're both spot on um, when it comes to Frank and Bobby. Well, what frustrates happy. me really the most from just an analysis or really from a moral and ethical compass point of view. Again, I think we might have talked about this before, but I I can't I don't want to go down the rabbit hole, but I just want to say it. You cannot tell me the U.S. attorneys, prosecutors, and FBI agents that were hammering out Cadillac Frank's deal in, in late 99, early 2000, they were so hell-bent on, on breaking up that Whitey Bulger you know, uh, illicit affair with the FBI and, and Conley and Morris and all those guys. They were so desperate to get that testimony. They allowed Frank to lie about at least a half dozen murders that he was involved in in the 90s. And the only one that's really come home, the chickens have come home to roost with uh, 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 is Stevie DeSaro. There are a lot of other Stevie DeSaro-like victims' families out there of, of victims of Cadillac Frank that, uh, you know, their, their loved ones' uh, cases were never brought to justice because the FBI was so desperate to nail John Conley that they turned the other, they turned the other cheek. Yeah, I think there are two really distinct differences because they think the Conley thing and um, Cadillac are different. I think Frank did his best to not tell the truth, 
and not keep up, why would he give up himself if he can avoid it? Um, he knew that he's going to get prosecuted for the murder once they decided, and why go any further? He's not going to get a deal on that murder. So why give up yourself or give up Bobby? I don't think Bobby probably knew had direct evidence, as we call it, on Frank. He probably knew from Frank talking to him. Frank said, I killed so-and-so. But you, you need a lot more than that if, like, and Bobby said, Frank told me I killed so-and-so. And, you know, maybe there's no body yet. There's no physical evidence. It's just one person saying. So you need a little bit more. We had talked about, not to say what we were talking about today, about the Hanrahan hit. But you got to have more than just one proven liar. Right. That's really what Bobby is. He's a proven liar. Um, so, I mean, proven liar. So any good attorney could really rip into those cases based on uh, conflicting um, debriefings by those two. That's probably why that happened. I mean, we mentioned on the last pod uh, in our Providence episode um, with the Kevin Hanrahan hit from September 92, you have someone going in front of the grand jury, Bobby DeLuca, pointing a finger at a guy that's still alive, Eddie Lato. But Bobby DeLuca has proven to be a very unreliable source. You can't put him on the stand as the only piece of evidence you have. Therefore, you know, it looks like right now Eddie's Eddie's uh, in the clear for that. So. I know, again, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but so in 2018, Salemi is convicted. Pauli Wiedek is convicted. Um, they're, they're both sentenced to life in prison. I, I was impressed uh, in the testimony of, of Mrs. DeSaro uh, in, in the sense that she seems to have really taken a, a, a big negative in her life and is now, I think she's a life coach and, and helping people. Uh, get past that type that place that type of tragedy, um, but it was it was heart wrenching to hear her, the testimony from her and her her children. Um, Deluca did Joe Deluca didn't seem that torn up uh, when he came out of the uh, out of his testimony. Tim White put a microphone in his face and he kind of started making jokes. What was your take on that? Yeah. It, it- he can really piss me off watching him walk and said the butler did it. You know, the arrogance of a man that helped move a body. That's just, you know, to me. But if you're going to be a gangster, that's the arrogance of you. That's uh, it's too bad. It's that guy dying. I think most of that was the show. I think he wasn't that way. I think he was probably a confused little gangster walking out of court. What do I say? I think he was trying to play a part so that you shut his mouth and move on. Because there have been some people that have cooperating with law enforcement and prosecutors and said, I really am sorry that you know, I caused this pain for family. And they might really re- need that. And hopefully Joe DeLuca found God before he died and told him that. Because I remember, if you remember Nikki Perry, Nikki Perry and Andy Malone had killed a guy named Joe on Scanlon. And before Nikki died, he had been prosecuted for it and went to jail for it. Well, nobody knew where the body was. They said they threw the body off the Jamestown Bridge. Convicted murderers, right? And then that we, he brought us to the body, which would be buried behind the building that was being built when, we, when um, Ed, um, Joe and his skin disappeared. My point is, he felt he needed to cleanse himself in front of somebody else, God. And he came forward and said, look, I'll show you where the body was. He physically drove us. He's a wheelchair. We drove with him and showed us where the body was. Maybe that's something Joe DeLuca should have done. At the end of the day, maybe apologize to the family. And that would be the right thing if you're really going to cooperate. If Bobby Luca would cooperate, I'm not sure I ever heard any of them say, I'm really sorry for what happened to your family. Now. That's what's going on. I have a, something to see what you guys think about the, the, the morality here. So, because I think about Scott's term, a cautionary tale, and I want to be very careful here because I, I don't want people to think I'm being insensitive or blaming the victim here because, you know, this guy getting strangled to death is obviously a, a horrible crime. But if you're going to swim with sharks and then one bites you in the ass and you're going to complain about oh, what a tragedy is, this is, that this shark bit my ass, well, what do you think happens when you, when you swim with sharks? Again, I, I'm not blaming the victim. I'm not saying it's okay. But, but back to Scott's notion of a cautionary tale to other people, like if you think you could get uh, in, in business with guys like this um, and, and you can walk away, and um, everything's going to be fine. Isn't that, isn't that like being naive? No question. I think that's why 
um, organized crime drives, just exactly that reason that um, most people think, hey, it's your problem, you get involved with these guys. But sometimes um, you you get pushed into those things because of those relationships you have. It's hard to keep them away sometimes. You're running a legit business, you try and balance. I let them in, let them out, maybe I pay them a little bit, not thinking. I'm giving that shock a little piece of meat and they go away. They're going to come back for a bigger bite. Right, That's, right. I think the message has to go out there. There's no, no favors for them. They exploit everything they can for you and every favor they do for you. You know, if, they, if someone breaks into your house and they go find the person who stole and bring your things back, you're going to owe them forever, which means you're going to get compromised someone else. So I think it's a great point to make to your viewers that Stay away, you know, and trust, go to law enforcement if someone's coming after your higher money and then deal with that way. But we grow up, everybody differently, we call it assimilation, where you grow up, you see it a lot easier to just, uh, I give them a little bit, they get off my back. And that's why they thrive. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I said it to Jimmy uh, off camera again when we were talking about this, and it reminded me of a conversation I had with my grandfather who while was not a mobster, was kind of mob adjacent, liked to run around with some of the Detroit uh, guys. And he, he ran into some financial problems in, in, the, in the 90s. And Billy Giacalone, who was one of the top, top guys, not just in Detroit, but in, you know, in America, uh, liked my grandpa and, and asked him if, if he wanted some help. He could help him put some money on the street. Um, and my grandpa told me, you know, I, I gave him a hard no. And uh, you, you can't get half pregnant with these guys. And my grandpa said something that I said to Jimmy. He said, uh, just so you know, in these business relationships, when things start to go south, they kill you first. Meaning they kill the, the Jew or the Italian associate. They're not the mobster himself or the other mobsters involved in that business are the ones that are killed last if they're killed at all. Yeah, they, they prey on typically people that are strong, that are physically strong, that Sometimes it just, I've heard it for years in state government, federal government, people in business, that it's just easy to just do this and get them off my back. And that's, you know, it sounds easy for me to say that, but it's hard to do that when you're just a regular Joe, depending on what you do for a living. If you work at you know, a postal service company where you, know, you would have to do them a favor, a postal comes in and you can get from them and that postal can, you might not even know what's in that postal. So they're um, really good at, um, what they do and how they can compromise. Well, uh, you know, I could sit on here for another two hours uh, with, with Steve. We're going to bring him back for another segment where we just talk about his undercover work. Um, this was great. I, I, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very, it's a tragic tale, um, but uh, it's a 30 year anniversary. One of his murders uh, uh, met his maker this, this last couple of weeks. I felt like it was appropriate to, to do a deep dive on Stevie DeSaro, RIP, Mr. DeSaro, uh, our, our uh, hearts go out to his family. Now there's only, you know, two, three guys left from the hit team. I don't know if I would call Jack Salemi a part of the hit team. He was there, allegedly. He never was ever brought on the carpet to talk about that. I don't know exactly where he is right now either. He's still alive, allegedly. Bobby DeLuca's still alive. Um, he's free. But Paul Wiedek, uh, he'll, he'll spend the rest of his life in prison. But, you know, Joe DeLuca passed away. And, and the, one, the last thing I'll say, I, I don't know if it's irony or um, tragic irony maybe, that he was buried uh, off Branch Avenue, which or Joe DeLuca was. And uh, Stevie DeSaro was buried off of Branch Avenue. Yeah, half a mile away. Yeah, no, well, I should say, uh, Joe DeLuca was laid out for his wake uh, on Branch Avenue, which was a half mile away from where he buried Stevie DeSaro's body. Um, it's eerie. But thank you, Steve, so much. Uh, we're huge fans of yours, and you, know, you can't manufacture this type of uh, insight. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure talking to you guys. Right, well, yeah, we thank you, you very you. much. So please like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we're going to have Steve back on really soon. For Ben Behind the Glass and my partner, Jimmy the Doctor, Bucciolato, Scott Bernstein, for Steve, for, for Stevie O'Donnell, thank you so much for joining us. Scott Bernstein, OG Pod, out. <laughs>